last time um, I finished, uh, we finished on, uh, on a little note, as you recall, that uh, the detail of uh, the garden where the pilgrim finds himself and meets the, the, other, the other poets. And he declares, in a way that seems to be really prideful, uh, on his place in this uh, trajectory, this literary uh, poetic tradition. And um, I was emphasizing last time that this is a detail that opens uh, for us, uh, opens our eyes to the um, ambiguity of gardens, uh, the ambiguity of, as Dante will go on dramatizing this idea of this ambiguity of gardens throughout uh, Purgatory, especially, and in other, other areas, in, 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 in oblique ways, not necessarily the, in monotonously uh, bucolic language, uh, this idea of the, the ambiguity of gardens. So, what are some of these ambiguities in Canto 4? Uh, we are drawn naturally to gardens, uh, and we are drawn to gardens because they reflect for us uh, some image of, of order especially if you're traveling through hell, then you do want this sort of, uh, you, you explore, you, you, you enter willfully this place that bears the fingerprints of uh, the human hand. Uh, it's, it's, it's something which has been elaborated by human beings. This is a divine place, and nonetheless, gardens mean that for us. But at the same time, they, they give us a sense of security, and in its enclosure, also a sense of our lordship over them. You know, it's something we can control. It's something that we see and, uh, and, and, and where we feel we belong. This is exactly the temptation that the pilgrim experiences in Canto IV. He relaxes, and this happens to all heroes in, epic in the epic tradition. When they enter gardens, they even... Uh, set aside their arms. They get disarmed in more ways than one. That is to say, they come to understand that they are, this is a place of shelter, a place which is uh, so peaceful and idyllic that one is no longer, or need not feel that one is in danger. In effect, that's where the danger is most powerful. Dante experiences a danger. The danger he experiences is that of a poetic hubris. He is descending into humility, that's the trajectory of his journey, and there he rests with Homer, Virgil, Lucan, etc., and he just says, he feels that he belongs, that his high genius allows him to be right there with them. I remind you of this little detail, exactly because it allows me to say more precisely uh, what, what the problems are in the representation of gardens, but especially to emphasize that Canto V and the drama that is unfolded in Canto V, a drama ostensibly of desire. Yes? It's the story of uh, the great passion of uh, a woman, one of the most famous women in literature, uh, uh, Francesca, uh, has with her brother-in-law, Paolo. But the point is that that drama stems directly from the crisis in the pilgrim's mind in Canto IV of Inferno. In what way? It is as if the experience of hubris about the celebrating one's own power and prowess as a poet now has to confront the consequences of that claim. Now Dante comes literally face to face with a reader of his poetry, and the reader of his poetry who understands his poetry in a way that, ne that was not necessarily the one intended by its author. We have now in Canto V the confrontation of reader and poet. And we shall see, Francesca is, of course, as you remember from your reading, just having, having, having read Canto V, is a great reader of texts. She goes on quoting Lancelot, not not in the version of Chrétien de Troyes, but it's, it's, it's a parallel version. Uh, the, the, it's, it's the same romance. Uh, she goes on quoting from The Art of Courtly Love, this text about the art of love by Andreas Capellanus. You may remember, I, I, I alluded to at least in one of the earlier talks, and goes on actually quoting to Dante, Dante's own poem in the Vita Nuova that we shall go and look at in, uh, in a while. So uh, let's start with Canto V. Where are we in the poem? What, 
what, where are we located? We are in the second circle, this, uh, your notes will tell you. We are in the larger area of so-called incontinence. And I really should emphasize to you something about, uh, we, we shall look at it in more, in more detail further on, but something about the topography, the moral to topography of uh, hell. What is the disposition? So what is the distribution of sins and sinfulness? What is actually uh, sin? What, what, what are we to understand for sin? For the time being, I'll tell you that for Dante, it's the will which is the locus of sin. You cannot really sin intellectually. You cannot have commit sins with your mind. You can have your mind which partakes and becomes an accomplice of the will. But it's primarily in the will, in the, 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 the voluntary action that you find, uh, you find sinfulness. That's the first thing. But where are we now? In the area of incontinence. Uh, what does that mean? Well, one thing, a way of making it very simple, you probably should know that the, um, that the, the shape, the diagram of the soul for Dante is very classical, very ancient. It's really uh, Aristotelian. It's the idea of, it's more or less figured as a triangle, uh, uh, which with on the left side you have, because it's always the left, the will, the area of the will. And then on the right side, you have the area of reason, okay? Where the two faculties of the soul, there are two faculties, like two feet of the body. Uh, there are two faculties of the soul uh, that where they meet, it's well, in the Middle Ages, using a classical term they call synderesis. That's to say, the, uh, this is the area where free will. In order to have free will, you have a conjunction of both will and reason. And that's the beginning of the moral life. It's not the end of it at all. It's really when only when you're really free, your will is free, that you can start making decisions and getting engaged in the world around you. Now, the soul is divided into three parts. It's a tripartite structure. and begins at the bottom. It's so-called, I should put it on the side because it's a will, the concupiscent appetite, which is really what Francesca experiences. You know, the, the, the uh, incontinence. Uh, lost in this form later will be gluttony, etc., uh, avarice, prodigality. In the middle area here, you would have the sensitive appetite, which is really the middle ground of Dante's hell, uh, violence, uh, uh, the kind of bestiality uh, that takes over the, the, the human mind. And then the third is the rational. Okay, so uh, the order, the geometry of hell uh, in a way is patterned on the order of the soul, the idea of the soul, in, of course in an inverted, uh, inverted form. We begin with in the area of uh, concupiscence, the area of lust. Someone was asking me what was lust last time, I think that we're going to uh, have uh, some kind of understanding uh, about this. So this is where we are in, uh, in the area of incontinence. The first one is, uh, is lust, or what Dante will call in a, with a formula, it's the area of the sinners who have s inverted the, the order, the hierarchical order of uh, the reason and the will. They have made pleasure, uh, the, they have invested pleasure with supreme lordship over the order of rationality. So uh, reason is somehow dimmed or is going to be used as uh, a rationale to explain as a kind of way of uh, creating alibis for the passion uh, of, uh, of, of Francesca. So this is, uh, this is the way the, the canto uh, begins. Um, the, uh, the second thing that I, uh, I have to mention as we read here is um, the particular uh, landscape that Dante evokes. It's a landscape of souls that go around, uh, swirling around, in, in a kind, in sort of a circular, uh, circular structure. And let me tell you a little detail here that you have to be careful as you read the poem, even about the directions of the pilgrim. Uh, for instance, if I were to ask you, which way is Dante descending into the spiral of hell? Uh, and then when you move into a spiral, it's very difficult to say if you're really going left or right, of course. But he's, he goes out of the way to say that he's always going leftward leftward because he's descending and as soon as we get to purgatorio he goes out of the way to tell us that he's now going rightward which is to say that hell is the inverted cosmos of purgatorio so it's really he's always going the same way only that as he goes into hell 
it's, it's his going down and his, his inverted. When he has to go from hell to purgatorio, the operation is going to be that of turning upside down in order to go finally in the straight way, the right way. Uh, the other detail is uh, that the, the, the symbolism of the circle, which as you know is very ancient, very old. There are uh, a number of ways of understanding direction in, uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, for instance, the linear direction implies that of human beings who are caught in time and they are going to some, some kind of purpose or precise destination. The angels are those who circle around the throne of God so that the circle implies the plenitude and perfection of movement. Clearly Francesca is involved, uh, who is caught in, in a world of love, in the passion of, of love. She's giving a, a kind of parodic version, a caricature of, uh, of the circular perfect movement of the mind. Uh, and, and of the angels around, uh, around uh, uh, the, 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 the divinity. Uh, the spiral, which is the movement of the pilgrim, combines line and circle. It implies that Dante is really, the mind is going in a circular way around the divinity, but he also has, has uh, uh, a purpose, has a name uh, to reach. So here, the two, uh, uh, Francesca and Paolo, are going around in circles, circles that will have and they will experience no rest. I think that the, the principle behind this representation of uh, desire as displacement, desire is always a part of displacement, something that Dante valorizes greatly. That's the ambiguity of Dante's thinking. Uh, uh, desire is displacement, because in this case, Paolo and Francesca, they get nowhere, and yet it's exactly this displacement that makes us aware that we are never where we should be that our hearts are always out of place. It's what Augustine says in the Confessions, uh, that the, he begins the Confessions with the awareness that his heart, he says, uh, is, is uh, unquiet, you know, the, the, the idea of the unquietness of the heart, uh, out of place. So that's what he's enacting. Dante is moving within the larger um, pattern of Augustine's thinking about, uh, about desire. Uh, and there'll be a lot of talk about that. You know what the word desire, by the way, which is in English, is the same as, as it's in Italian or, or in Latin. You know what it means. You know, it's, 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 it's linked to the stars. You know, to, to have desire is to know that you are not uh, quite uh, uh, see that uh, at the end. They see that uh, you know, we are sort of removed, or removed from uh, the, 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 the world of, uh, of stars. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a word that is linked usually with consideration, another word that implies that the mind moves alongside. You know, you consider, when I consider how my light is spent, when you consider is, is a way of moving with, uh, along, the, the mind manages to move with the circularity and perfection of the stars. All of this is irrelevant to the point at, uh, it's, uh, at, at hand here. Uh, Dante meets, uh, so we are in the world of, uh, begins this, uh, this, this canto with a number of, uh, a number of uh, uh, metaphors of, of birds. You, you realize that, first of all, he starts around lines 30 about the hellish storm. It's, not, it's, it's, it's the externalizing of, uh, of uh, the storm inside, the, the inner storm, never resting, seizes and drives the spirits before it's smiting or whirling them about, etc. It continues. Uh, and as in the cold season, the wings bear uh, the starlings along in a broad, dense flock, so does the blast, the, that blast, the wicked spirits, hither, thither, downward, upward, it drives them. No hope ever comforts them, not to say of rest, but of less pain. And then the cranes, and Dante asks uh, Virgil, Master, who are these people whom the black hair so scourges? And now we have an enumeration, another uh, application of the epic, uh, epic, an epic device, uh, enumerating the epic that, uh, that, that, that has, it's, it's always uh, driven by the desire for totality to include all things within the compass of its representation, it always has uh, this enumerative uh, style. And now here we have uh, a number of figures that Dante points out, that, that Virgil points out, and they're all queens at the beginning. Queens, or founders of cities. 
keep this in mind because I think that part of the issues that Dante is raising, and you can think about it, we can talk about it if you wish, is the relationship between eros and politics, uh, pleasure and the city. Where does, where does pleasure, what is the place of pleasure in the economy of, uh, of the city? Now, well, uh, well, let's see who they are. One is the empress of people of many tongues, who so corrupted by licentious vice that she made lust lawful in her law to take away the scandal into which she was brought. Uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the emphasis of the line is this lust becoming lawful, lust becoming uh, public and, 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 and accepted. And she's Semiramis of Assyria, uh, whom we read in the success Ninus. Uh, uh, then uh, the next one is Dido, who is uh, uh, both a Virgil um, invention in many ways, where Virgil uh, in the Aeneid, this is a reflection on the Aeneid, there's a poem of love too, you know, the, the uh, Dante cannot but think about the, the place of uh, how Rome, Rome's conquest uh, could appear to be libido of power, libido dominandi, and yet, and, and he's really playing with the idea that the uh, Rome or Roma, as you know, is the, what we call the, I have to use this term because I can't think of an English term, uh, bustrophedon. You know what it is, a bustrophedon, right? A bustrophedon, uh, it's very easy. It's the a Greek term meaning a reversal. Uh, Roma, right, as in a mirror, becomes amor because it's, Venus is the mother of Aeneas. So there is this idea, again, of uh, a link, an inner link between love or uh, love and, and, and politics and the city. Uh, and Virgil writes the Aeneid uh, literally as, as a love poem. That's to say the ideology of Rome is an ideology of, based on, on of, of Rome is an ideology based on desire, uh, the idea which Augustine will counter by saying, yeah, this is not really love, this is lust for power. And the distinction that someone was raising here, uh, the gentleman was raising last time about how is lust related to love, you already start seeing the antagonism between the two of them. Augustine, a Roman, uh, an African, but a Roman, uh, Roman thinker, uh, is really writing about and belongs and reflects on the great myths, on the mythology of Rome. And to him, this is true in the Confessions, but it's especially true in the City of God, where he just juxtaposes the earthly city, Rome, to the heavenly city, the heavenly Jerusalem. The two cities are opposed to each other. There he reflects on Rome as a city based on lust for power, and from that point of view, really not different from any other empires. They're all Rome, uh, like uh, say the Persian Empire, the Greek claims for empire and whatnot, are all part of a long sequel of, uh, of uh, violence and uh, uh, imperial, uh, imperial fantasies. Uh, uh, so Dante is, is, is thinking along, along these lines, and we shall see where that will take him in a moment. Then there is Cleopatra of Egypt, Helen, and the story of the fall of, uh, of, of Troy. And then finally, uh, the story of Tristan, who, as you know, belongs is really a medieval, medieval invention, Tristan and Isolde. We are going to see now uh, Lancelot de Guinevere in a moment. So uh, the presence of Tristan shows one thing, that all the he heroes and heroines of antiquity are viewed through the lenses of medieval romances. They may belong to the grand epics of classic the classical world. Dante will see them through that optics of uh, romances, the literature of desire. And he showed me more than a thousand shades. Name them as he pointed. This is the, 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 the catalog of the epic catalog of whom love parted from our life. When I heard my teacher name the knights and ladies of all times, pity came upon me, and I was as one bewildered. Now, this is really the first time that Dante introduces the notion of pity. 
in uh, the poem. And we shall see by the end of the, of the canto that he's going to be overwhelmed by pity and he's going to faint after he hears the story of Francesca. He was so overwhelmed that he fell, he says, like a dead body falls. It's a fainting, it's, 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 it's sympathy. Maybe it's a little bit of a self-recognition. Maybe it's, we shall see that it's a way of coming to grips with his own responsibilities. Maybe, maybe some of his responsibilities. But the point I want to make there with this pity is that you do know, Dante does not know the, epi, the, the poetics of Aristotle. Uh, but he knows whatever is available uh, through Horus. He knows it's quite a lot. Uh, the, the, the point here is that Dante goes on reflecting, it could become a, a paper topic for some of you enterprising spirits, some of you may be, on the relationship between pity and justice. How throughout the poem he goes on thinking about these two terms. Is, does justice necessarily need pity? Or is there some kind of justice that must learn how to be pitiless, that has no place for, for uh, this kind of compassion? Are they too necessarily antagonistic? Or is there some way of, of, of thinking, of, of, uh, of a meeting, a uh, meeting point between them? This is the first time he introduces this, uh, this idea of pity, a kind of recognition, sort of a sense that it could be he who is in that, in that, that position. And he begins, poet, I would fain speak with these two that go together and seem so light upon the winds. So he doesn't talk to any of the major classical figures. He chooses two people from his own time, two people from the ordinary uh, life around him, two people in the, uh, this, by this time, Dante may very well be living in that area of Italy, which is Ravenna, not quite Ravenna, but in that area of Ravenna. Thou shall see when they are near us, and they, they entreat them then by the love that leads them, and they will come. As soon as the wind bent, O oh, wearied souls, come and speak to us, and speak with us, if one forbids it not. You realize that the name of God is never mentioned here in hell, if not uh, as, a, as a discourse that takes place here on earth, but the souls in, in uh, hell will all use, always use periphrastic constructions, turns of phrases as if it would be, it would be highly improper uh, for Dante to allow them or even for them to acknowledge that which they never really acknowledge. Now, if one forbids it not. And then as doves summoned by desire uh, come with wings poised and motionless as to the sweet nest, born by the will through the air, so this left the troop where Dido is. Again, the presence of Dido, uh, that, that, uh, the Virgilian, the Virgilian myth of Dido. Um, and also the other possibility of Rome. Uh, Virgil is writing about the, 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 the great battle between Carthage and Rome as two ways of choosing a civilization, two ways of, of deciding how one should organize oneself, how should one experiment with, uh, with, with cities. Uh, uh, so coming to us through the malignant air, such force uh, had my loving call. Uh, and now listen to how Francesca speaks. O living creature, gracious and friendly, who goes through the murky air, visiting us who stain the world with blood. She's killed, she was killed by the way, by her husband, who caught Francesca and his brother, Paolo, in a tryst. So it's, um, uh, that's what the allusion to the blood is. If the king of the universe were our friend, we would pray to him for thy peace, since thou hast pity of our evil plight. Of that which thou pleased to hear and speak, we will hear and speak with you while the wind is quiet, and here it is. And now she begins the description of her life, where she was born, uh, most of the narratives in, uh, in, in Inferno begin with this idea of birth. Uh, you saw that in the case of Virgil, and you see it once again here in the case of, uh, of, uh, in the case of Francesca. And they begin with birth uh, for a number of reasons, but because birth is uh, for Dante the, that event that somehow could potentially have changed and have imparted a different direction to the world or could end in uh, nothing, as in the case of Francesca. And so it's a, very, a great piece of literature, but she of herself uh, did not really achieve, uh, achieve much. And now she talks about her city in terms that clearly contrast with this movement of the souls 
caught in the storm. There they go endlessly uh, in the air, and now she evokes the place of what she really wants is, 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 is rest. The city where I was born lies. That's the, the image of the stability of a city she has lost, where the Po with the streams that join it descend to rest. And now, three tercets in Italian, all beginning with the word love. Love made into a kind of transcendent divinity. It is the great subject of, uh, of her experience. Look at this. Love, um, love, uh, which quick, is quickly kindled in the gentle heart, sees this man for the fair form that was taken from me, and the manner afflicts me still. Love, which absolves no one beloved from loving, sees me so strongly with this charm, that as thou seest, does not leave me yet. Love brought us to one death. Uh, what is she saying? Well, a number of things, and I really have to give this to you. First of all, she's really quoting uh, important literature. The first line, uh, love, which uh, 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 the translation is love, uh, which absorbs no uh, love, which is quickly kindled in the gentle heart. And you know that this is really uh, a quotation from uh, one of Dante's sonnets in the Vita Nuova that you read, chapter 20. Love, that's how Dante starts. Love and the gracious heart are a single thing. As Dante quotes the poetics of the sweet new silence. When it's early, he says, tells us in his poem, one can more be without the other, one can no more be without the other than one that than can the reasoning mind without its reason, etc. So uh, it's, it's clearly meant for Francesca to um, uh, flatter uh, the sense of authorship of the poet himself. It's part of a seductive strategy also that she can use. The second image, that, but love that uh, uh, does not allow anyone who lo loves from returning, reciprocating the love, it really comes from the so-called rules of love that Marie de Champagne dictates in book three of The Art of Courtly Love. And I want to read this. Uh, it's, the translation is not quite all that, that accurate, but I think, uh, I'm sorry, I get the wrong one. Uh, the wrong book, uh, The Art of Courtly Love, the, the book three, and these are the famous, it ends with the rules of love. I will, I will, I'll explain what they are. And rule nine says, it, I can really read some of them to you so you have an understanding of what courtly love is. If this is the mind of, which applies very well to Francesca. Francesca imagines herself as really a courtly uh, love heroine. She lives in the world of a king, you know, the, uh, God is the king of the universe. She's in the court of the king of love, maybe. And these are some of the, the, the concerns of the, the, the rules of love and the art of courtly love. Marriage is no real excuse for not loving. It's a way of saying adultery is the law of courtly love. He who is not jealous, number two, cannot love. No one can be bound by a double love. And then they can go, boys do not love until they arrive at the age of maturity. It leaves that very unclear what the age of maturity can be. Seven, when one lover dies, a widowhood of two years is required of the survivor. Number eight, no one should be deprived of love without the very best of reasons. Number nine, no one can love unless one is impelled by somebody else's love, which is exactly the line that Francesca mentions, number nine. Why these rules of love? And what are they? And what is she saying? What, she's, what, what Andreas, first of all, is doing by having these rules of love and having a reducing love to an art is a way of acknowledging that love is the most transgressive, disruptive of all experiences. And therefore, it needs to be formalized. It needs to be contained. Made may be part of a game, as in perhaps is the thrust of Andreas Capellano's uh, thinking, or made to be part of an acceptable ceremony, which is the other possible reading of what is happening. Francesca falls completely, uh, squarely within this tradition of believing that she lives in a world of love where there is no other possible resistance. In effect, these three tercets with which, which I read to you about love, love and love. They're really meant to cast love as a transcendent force that no one can really, that she at least, cannot withstand. What she's doing is abdicating 
the power of her will to the irresistible, omnipotent uh, presence of this love. It's part of a strategy, not of acknowledging any responsibility, it's part of a strategy to instead find for herself an alibi. I was made to do that. The literature of yours and the literature of Andreas Capellanus were filters of love. You understand what I mean, how in romances you always have filters of love. No one is going to take the responsibility, said, well, uh, you know, the, uh, I had too much to drink, or I read the great poem, or whatever, and so I, I, I was doing that. It's a way for Dante to show the, the blindness of Francesca to the reality of her situation. And this, the, where she is, a kind of unwillingness to give up that which is really the quality of sin and the trait of sin, a habit. Sin is sin in the measure in which it has become a habit, a way, of, a way of clinging to it and not acknowledging that there may be some kind of alternative or something different uh, to it. So Dante goes on now enter, uh, entertaining the arguments when I answered again, alas, how many sweet thoughts, how what great desire brought them to the woeful past. And then Francesca, that torments make me weep for grief and pity, but tell me, in the time of your sweet sign, how and by what occasion did love grant you to know your uncertain desires? And she answered, there is no greater pain than to recall the happy time in misery, and this thy, te thy teacher knows. But if thou hast so great desire to know our love's first root, which is a way of almost even that metaphor of the root of love, the, the origin of love, but she calls it the root of love, as if the passion her passion were the flower of, of love. Uh, I shall tell as, when, as one may that weeps in telling. We read one day for the pastime of Lancelot, how love constrained him, were alone and had no misgivings. Many times that reading drew our eyes together and changed the color in our faces. But one point alone it was that mastered us. When we read for that long for smile was kissed by so great a lover, he who never shall be parted from me all trembling kissed my mouth. A Galeotto was the book and he that wrote it. That day we read in it no farther. While the one spirit said this, the other, Paolo, whose name means little in Latin, as you know, Paulus, small, wept so that for pity assumed as if in death and dropped, dropped like a dead body. And that's the end uh, of the canto. Well, we could say it's, it's, uh, it's an amazing uh, uh, story, undoubtedly we could, we could talk about a number of things. The first thing is uh, uh, that this is a scene represented through um, uh, reading, the story of reading. You're, you're aware of that, right? This is clearly, uh, she reads, they read, she says that when one day they were reading for delight. That's probably part of... Uh, um, the, the, the concerns that Dante has, how should we read if we read for delight? They read for delight. Uh, is there some other way of reading? Uh, is delight clearly, it's, it's, it's the constitutive elements of reading literary texts, but is there something else that we could do along the way? What is her problem really? Let's continue with this idea of reading. She's reading the story of Lancelot. Lancelot and Guinevere. You do know the story, it's especially, you could read, it's not, it's not, the story of Chrétien de Troyes, but you could easily go on, uh, uh, if you want to write about Chrétien de Troyes, Lancelot, and, and Canto V, you can. Dante does refer to the stories of Chrétien de Troyes often in his uh, theoretical works. Uh, the story of uh, Lancelot is the story of uh, adultery at court. Lancelot is the secret lover of the queen. Clearly out of the desire, and that says something about the nature of desire, to really supplant the king, Arthur. Uh, there's a triangle here at stake, a triangle of desire. Uh, and, and, and Francesca imitates this triangle. I will talk to about it in a moment. Lancel, the story of Lancelot is a story of, uh, uh, let me go a little bit, a bit into that. It's the story of, like all the stories of Chrétien de Troyes, they begin on the great feasts of Christianity. It's, I think it's usually the Ascension, uh, Easter, the Pentecost, one of the great feasts. Uh, and the heroes 
are sitting around boasting about themselves. No one of them uh, is doing anything heroic, but they all talk about how great they were. It's a little bit this, like the parodic version that you have uh, of the battle, of the argument between Ulysses uh, and, uh, and Ajax in uh, the, last can the last book of the Metamorphosis, where they talk about who is the, 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 the hero worthy of inheriting the arms of the great Achilles. And they talk about not the present prowess now, but what they were. In the story in Chrétien, uh, clearly the idea is that the heroic age is over and done with. And the whole romance goes on exploring, pondering about that which the reasons why the heroic age may have come to an end. And what it is is that uh, the secret love affair between Lancelot and Guinevere. The story starts, it goes on, where they are sitting around drinking ale uh, and talking. Uh, a mysterious figure comes from the outside and kidnaps the queen. The, the knights who are sitting around don't move. And everybody is expecting Lancelot to get up and go and rescue the queen, but he won't out of fear that if he were too impetuous, it would be this, the, the secret affair that he has with the queen would probably be, be discovered. That hesitation, that moral hesitation of Lancelot is really the cause of, it's, it's the emblem of the falling from aristocratic virtues. There is now the intrusion of a, a time, a temporal wedge between the thought and the action. And then, of course, Lancelot will have to go on the famous cart of shame, exposed to the ridicule of the whole town before he can go on really trying to rescue uh, the, the, the queen. So this is, but if you think about it, then Chrétien is already reflecting on the crisis of the city in terms of the private passions. Something is really knowing at the heart of the city, and it's really the question of desire. The inability to distinguish between the public and the private, the inability to separate somehow the two, or find some sort of a hard, uh, threading the, the, the line between uh, those two concerns. In Canto V, this is really what Francesca does. Dante is exploring reading. So she is reading the text of Lancelot and lapses into an imitative strategy of reading. She wants to be like the heroine that she reads about. She refuses to take an interpretive distance from whatever specular image. She wants to feel like a queen. And she thinks that Paolo can be like Lancelot. And this is exactly what, what we call the mimetic quality. It's not my term, it's the term of uh, uh, René Girard who has written about this question of the imitative structure of desire. Between us and the object of desire, there is always the presence of uh, a mediator. And this time, in this case, the mediator is Lancelot for, uh, for Paolo and it is Guinevere for Francesca, but there is more to this story. For instance, you cannot read this story without thinking about how Dante frames the experience of Francesca with the language of time. Do you see how, how many references there are to time? Uh, there's no greater grief that remembering happiness, the past happiness, and this your doctor, meaning, meaning, uh, Virgil knows very well. And then she starts talking about her adventure. We were reading one day, you remember? That day we read no further. It's all about time, about the question of time, as if an experience. So what is the problem with this idea of time? Why is Francesca understood? Why is her story represented in terms of time? In effect, I think Francesca wants, there's one great passion that she has, and her passion is to do away with time. She's expressing the desire that her happiness that lasts here very briefly, a brief instant, may really last an eternity. Or maybe, or maybe, just maybe, she may expressing the wish that, or the idea, the insight more than the wish, that one moment of happiness is well worth an eternity of pain. Or maybe, she's just saying uh, that it's not too bad that the love story I had only lasted the briefest uh, possible time. At any rate, what all this shows is that primarily Francesca not only abdicated choice 
and not only thought that her own will was powerless vis-a-vis -vis the irresistible force of this transcendent idea of love, but above all, she has betrayed the, the order of necessity and time, that her passion violates the order of time. And above all, from this point of view, Dante goes on reflecting about his responsibilities of an author, as an author, uh, when he's confronted with the reader. What have I done? What have I written that what I write has been understood in a way that is not necessarily the one that he meant, uh, the meaning that he meant to assign to the Vita Nuova? So these are some of the concerns, and we can find some others. Let me just uh, pass on to Canto VI, which is really not uh, completely unlike uh, what we have been describing here. Now we go into Canto. Dante goes, that's another part of this other strategy. Whatever Dante has found out about passion, about desire, about this uh, in, in the world of appetites, uh, uh, and whatever he has decided about uh, himself, and the meaning that this may have for him as a poet, in that scene of fainting at the end, he will go on, this will become the premise for other concerns raised in Canto VI, which, as you know, is a political canto. But this is the strategy of Dante. Let me see, I found out certain things about me, my responsibility. I found some things about the, uh, the disruptive quality of uh, desire vis-a-vis -vis the political order. Now, let me find out, let me see uh, if, if uh, let me find out how, how authentic this finding may be. Let me move into a public realm. So we go from the world of the court, the private world of Francesca, now to literally the world of the city, the world of Florence, where we are still talking about incontinence in a different form, the question of gluttony, uh, gluttony and uh, politics. And let's see, so he takes elements that he has already anticipated here in Canto V, the political, and goes on thinking about politics in, uh, in, Canto, in Canto VI. Um, here we go then with Canto VI, the third circle, uh, the gluttonous. With the return of my mind, with the return of my mind that was shut off when the piteous state of the two kinsfolk, which was quite confounded me with grief, new torments and new souls in torment I see about me, wherever I move and turn and set my gaze. I find, first of all, the, pr the presence of the word mind, in Italian is mente, in line one, uh, very, very, very suggestive. We are dealing here now with bodies. Canto six is all about bodies. It's all about gluttonous uh, souls who were bodies, who took care of the bodies. But Dante uses as a counterpoint the question of mind, as if uh, this, the sin of these bodies, the sin of this gluttonous, has also been the sin of not thinking in terms of mind. The mind is a necessary counter, a, ne a necessary complement to the presence of bodies. The word mind, of course, as you know, or in Italian, in English, we have mental, in Italian is mente, Latin mens, really comes from the Latin for measure. Uh, the mind is that which measures things. The mind is that which gives a sense of the measure of uh, even our own, our own desires. And the, and, the, and, the, and the metaphor of mind appears throughout Canto VI. Uh, we are asked to think of that which is missing in this uh, biological uh, reflection, a reflection about the, what I call the biology of politics. Politics now reduced to the question of appetites of bodies. It's not, normally we have the pride of minds when we think about, you know, the people who have whatever fantasies, whatever megalomanias, whatever desires, but mental above all when we talk about politics. But here it's, it's really a question of politics in terms of uh, the inexhaustible appetites of bodies. Uh, and so we are going to, to talk about politics and, uh, and gluttony, politics and bodies. Dante here meets uh, the figure that is uh, presiding, the mythological figure that is presiding over Cantos, uh, this area of gluttony, is uh, um, the classical figure of the three-headed uh, Cerberus, a way of hinting about the, 
uh, the voraciousness, uh, uh, the many mouths of this, uh, this uh, monstrous animal, Cerberus, a beast fierce and hideous and so on. Um, and we do know uh, that the landscape is uh, stinking and that the, an endless rain, uh, there are hints that this is really uh, uh, one of uh, uh, some kind of repulsive uh, form of uh, waste and food. Uh, it's that the rain makes them howl like dogs and the profane wretches uh, uh, often turn themselves on one side making a shelter for the other. When Cerberus, the great worm, perceived us, he opened his mouth and showed us the fangs, not one of his limbs keeping still, and my leader, and so on. It's the dog that yelps for greed and becomes quiet when it bites its food, being all absorbed and struggling to devour it. Such became these foul visages of the demon Cerberus. Uh, we passed over the shades that were beaten down by the heavy rain, setting our feet on the emptiness, which seemed real bodies. Uh, this is uh, it's the the great description and figuration of gluttony. Uh, bodies that are always empty and they, 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 uh, and they are empty now. They are punished to be empty uh, as empty forms and that they seem, real. they're not bodies, they seem real bodies. They were all lying on the ground except one who sat up as soon as he saw us passing before him. O thou who art led through this hell, he said to me, recall if thou canst, thus thou wast begun before I was ended. Another little reference to birth, the birth of Dante and the death of, uh, but it's part of a cycle, you know? There's no necessary connection between the two events. The death of, uh, uh, the name is Giacomo, meaning a pig, that's the way he was surnamed in the streets of Florence, and uh, the death and the, the birth of uh, the pilgrim. I said to him, thy anguish, the, the anguish as thou perhaps takes thee from my memory, again the word is mente, the mind, so that I do not seem ever to have seen thee. Tell me who you are, for in a place of such misery and under such a penalty, that if any is greater, none is so loathsome. And he said to me, thy city, we are talking about Florence, this is the politics of the city, thy city, he doesn't say our city, your city. So he's already, he, Jack who views himself is outside of it, not really occupying a place within the city, which is so full of envy that already the sack runs over, held me within it in the bright light when you citizens, once again, a distance of Chaco from the, the, the city of Florence, called me Chaco for the damning fault of gluttony, as thou seest, I lie helpless in the rain, and in my misery I'm not alone, for all these are under the same penalty for the same fault. And he said, no more. Okay, here the, I have to stop a little bit uh, the, to tell you what something that you already caught, of course, what the basic metaphor, what the basic conceit is in this camp. And it's the conceit of the city and the body. You, in, classic, in the classical world, you are used to the conceit between, of the relationship between the soul and the city. Uh, but for Dante, this is a soulless city. The only way to talk about it is through this image, which is very ancient, very Roman, actually. Uh, the story of uh, uh, the city as a corporate, as a body, as a corporate structure. The image, some of you readers of Shakespeare, you may remember your Coriolanus, where Coriolanus makes the same speech about uh, the city and, and the body. But it really goes back to a historian of the classical world that Dante absolutely loves. He's not the only one, uh, all the way Augustine uh, is using, the name is Livy, who wrote this famous book about, from, about the, from the foundation of Rome, a, a Roman historian uh, who tells the, the history of Rome. And one of the stories he tells is that of uh, uh, the famous uh, civil war in uh, Rome. The civil war between patricians and plebeians. The plebeians, the workers, were so tired of what was happening in the city. They were doing all their work. That's the, that, the way they complain. But they had few of the pleasures coming from living in the city. That they decided to secede. It is the famous secession whereby they go. It's a kind of schism. They go on the retreat on the Aventine Hills, one of the seven hills of Rome. And the patricians, the city is paralyzed, as you can imagine, it's a strike. 
the patricians send one of their an emissary, a man by the name of Menenius, to convince the plebeians to return to the city. And Menenius manages to do this by telling the plebeians a famous fable, which is called, is still known as the fable of Menenius. What does he tell them? He said, look, the city is really like a body. When you have a body, the hands work. Yeah, it seems that the mouth enjoys and savors the great pleasures of foods and so on. It seems that the stomach can be full, but actually whatever they produce and take in and they ingest, they redistribute to the bodies, to the rest of the body, to the hands, the feet, etc. Because the city is like a body. That's the analogy between the corporate structure of the city, the idea that the city is a corporation, huh? and uh, which by the way we carry on the a reminder of this, that how vital this is, we carry on a dime. I don't have a dime with me, uh, but if you have a dime, you can read uh, a pluribus unum, means it's one body, out of many limbs, out of many members. It's still an image that we carry, it's still a, a conceit that we have, right? So the idea is uh, that the city is like a body, and the plebeians are convinced, and they go back to, to, back to order and they recompose the order of the city. This is the fundamental uh, structure here. But I said something else which is really is going to, does that believe in the corporate structure of the city? Uh, can it really hold together? And I, 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 I go on submitting to you that he no longer believes in this. If you, when you read the canto, uh, you will see that all the body parts are literally littering the city. They all mention the, 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 the nails, the hands, the heart, the, the, the beard, the hair, etc., the mouth, uh, sort of spread all over and, and as if to, to imply the impossibility of constituting these body parts into an organic, unified uh, uh, totality. So um, uh, there's another little issue here that is being raised and I want to talk about before the end of, uh, of the hour, the question of civil war and what Dante understands by civil war. Because Dante's political thought, the reality of his political thinking is always the civil war. I'll come to that. Let me just give you some textual evidence and then we'll go on. I answered him, Chacco, that the stress so weighs on me that it bids me weep. But tell me if thou canst what the citizens of the divided city, this is now Florence, shall come to, and whether any is there is just. And tell me the cause of such discord assailing it. It's an amazing image, discord, because it's a musical metaphor, accord, discord, but really comes from, it, sh it makes the heart, that's where the word comes from, discord, makes the heart the place, the receptacle, where all the envy, all these jealousies that destroy the city uh, are, are placed, are located. And he said to me, after long strife, they shall come to blood and the party of the rustics shall drive out the other with much offense. Then, by force of one who is now maneuvering, meaning the Pope, that party is destined to fall. This is uh, the world in Ghibellines, uh, that within which the city is divided to fall within three years and the other to prevail, long holding its head high and keeping the first and the grievous burdens for all their tears and shame. Two men are just, they are not heated there. Pride, envy, and avarice. These are the causes, these are the sparks, he calls them. These are the causes that have set these hearts on fire. Here, he made an end of his grievous uh, uh, words. And then Dante goes on, uh, uh, literally, evoking uh, a street scene in Florence. He goes on asking about some other characters of the city. I would still learn from thee, and I beg thee to grant me further speech. Farinata, he mentioned about whom we shall see next Thursday in Canto 10 of Inferno. And Tegiaio, men of such worth, Jacopo Rusticucci, Arrigo, and Mosca, and the rest, whose minds were set on well-doing, tell me where they are and give me knowledge of them, for I'm pressed with a great desire to know whether they share in heaven's sweetness or the bitterness of hell. I would like to point out to you the presence of this, uh, of, the, of the language of gluttony throughout, sweetness, bitterness, 
pleasant and pleasantness. Uh, this really runs through the cantos, the canto and gives its and, and links together gluttony and the politics. It's the body can see the body metaphor, but also these other experiences. But what is happening here is he asks, as Dante asks about this other famous Florentines, men of such worth. He says, where are they? They achieved so much, they were so set on well-doing in the city. And the, the English cannot quite render the ambiguity of the Italian. The ambiguity of the Italian is ben fare, which is really very difficult to translate because you don't know if it means doing well or doing good. And that, that impossibility of deciding what the sentence really means is exactly uh, what Dante is dramatizing here. What he's dramatizing is the distance between human perspective, human, the judgments that we make as human beings, and the divine judgment on the dealings and doings of these famous people, the, dis the discrepancy between them. Here on earth we may judge one way, then the real, the reality of the worth and value of these other people uh, can be different. So we are, uh, we are talking about, he's talking about they're among the black souls, as to say, they're further down in, in, in the fire, and different faults weigh them down to the depth. What an extraordinary metaphor, the weight, the weight, the, the, the burden of sin, but it's really, a, an image that goes back, the gravity, the question of gravity. This is, we speak of civic gravity, but here it's a different kind of gravity. It's, it's an idea of, um, it's an old idea when you want to talk about the weight that we carry within us, the gravity we have within us, that gravity is love. The, the way of deciding, or the way of understanding this line, there's a passage in the Confessions of Augustine where Augustine says that he wants to exemplify why some people go up, other people go down. And he says it's like the gravity of objects around us. A stone, you drop a stone and the stone goes down out of its own gravity, at its own specific weight. A fire he says, goes up out of its own specific weight. We are carried wherever our love carries us. We are, our, our, our love is our own gravity, inner gravity. And whether we go up or down, it depends according to the direction of our desires. But let me just go back to, this is uh, uh, to give you a sense of all the resonances of this canto, but at the heart of it all, there is the question of civil war between Welfs and Ghibellines, between patricians and plebeians. Dante is the whole of history, Roman history, whether he's going to read Virgil, or we read Lucan, or he will read uh, Statius. They're all, who actually deals not with Roman history, in this great, uh, great uh, epic at Thebaid, he reads, uh, he's really reading Greek history, the story of Oedipus and the Theocles and Polynes. They view history uh, from the point of view of the Civil War. Now, so let me just formulate the question of uh, pol the political understanding Dante has. For those of you who may have read a little bit of Monarchia, for instance, which is this treatise about the, the desirable form of uh, a universal confederation of states under one emperor. That's the grand vision that Dante has in Monarchia. Eh? He thinks about the, the needed unity of all states, a kind of sort of, we could call it today, a confederation of states very much patterned uh, uh, on, on the, Roman, the Roman Empire. The idea of the, in fact, the Roman Empire becomes the model for this kind of unification. Uh, so that's really what we, most of us think that Dante's political vision is. In effect, Dante's history, especially as a kind of inevitable, satanic form of civil war. So, so harsh can, is he going to be about the realities of the cities, and you really wonder, how can he go on elaborating a theory of a constructive theory of politics? You see what I'm saying? Once you are so harsh about the reality of politics, then you really wonder, how can one go around really thinking that politics can be necessary? If it's necessary, you can explain that it's somehow useful, that it's feasible. Uh, where does this idea, what is this, this, this understanding of Rome? Um, come to him. Dante does not really agree with Virgil, and Dante does not agree with Virgil's greatest critic, who is Augustine in the City of God. For Virgil, 
Rome is the providential empire, an empire that can really bring about, unify the whole world. Augustine writes against Virgil and says, no, because even Rome, as I just indicated to you a little earlier, even Rome is part of the history of violence. Dante comes along and pulls together within the Divine Comedy the question of Rome and the needed empire and the question of the civil war. What do they have in common? What is that connects them? Dante's argument is the following. You, Virgil, are right in believing in the unity of all mankind, a stoic idea that we all live in a cosmopolis, in a city which is the city of the world where we all find a place. And you, Augustine, are right in claiming that the empire is all built and based on uh, libido and lust. You're right, you're both right, and yet you are both wrong, precisely because you contradict each other. And what Dante says to Augustine, if there is no empire, then we are living in a world of disorder and lawlessness. The empire becomes the necessary remedy to the evils of the civil war. The civil war is the condition where my own brother, my own neighbor can, be, can become my own enemy. Augustine does not acknowledge the reality of the civil war. To him, it's just empire and the empire is evil. And we will finish with the famous line, what do I care who governs me provided that they don't make me sin? It's the famous Christian response to the idea of the evil, the historical evil of empires. Let me retreat into myself and find within myself some kind of, uh, of uh, comfort and some kind of shelter. And Dante will respond to him, says, no, that's not enough. Because once you think that you have retreated into yourself, then there is the reality of the civil war that will reach into you. What I have been explaining to you, and I will stop, uh, because I want to talk about something else before we go, Canto 7. What I've been trying to explain to you is that, that the movement from Canto 5 to Canto 6 of Inferno, it's a movement from the internal world of desires that seem to be so private and so personal. That then I said Dante has to go outside of himself to test, to, sh to find out what the authenticity is of what he has found out in Canto 5. In Canto 6, the political canto, will tell them that there is no such a comfort zone of one's own inner world. That inner world is necess necessarily part of the outside world, and the outside world will encroach upon and will enter one's own inner, inner world. Uh, the terms for this kind of movement between the inner and the outer are really uh, Virgil and Augustine. Virgil with the idea of the defense of the empire, Augustine with his undermining of the notion of the necessity of uh, the empire. Dante will go on uh, uh, harmonizing the two visions. So he will endorse the idea of the empire, aware that that's the only possible best response to the tragedy of civil wars. Let me uh, say just a few things about Canto VII. Uh, the, the, and then I'll give you a chance to ask some questions. There should be two, three minutes for questions. Uh, canto seven um, uh, also is a canto that uh, can be read symmetrically with the other canto sevens of the Divine Comedy, Purgatorio seven, just as canto six. I, I neglected to mention it, but uh, canto six of Inferno is about the city and politics, canto six of Purgatorio about the nation, canto six of Paradise about the empire. So they're really connected. The same thing with Canto Seven. This is the only Canto where Dante does not individualize sinners. He meets avaricious, the avaricious and the prodigals, and they are sort of taken in a kind of, they have no, there's no individual figuration for them. Uh, it is as if uh, this became a kind of an anonymous, therefore more collective kind of problem, avaricious and prodigality, which he represents in terms of the counter movement of Scylla and Charybdis. And here we have the great figuration of fortune. You remember, as I call her, uh, the Vanna White 
of the time, the, the lady who is uh, uh, at the wheel of fortune, uh, turning blindfolded. Uh, and, 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 and let me say something about, about this figuration. It's, it's a, Dante describes it as, uh, uh, you know, what, what is it? Uh, it's a great, a, a, an idea that I, um, uh, what is it about the avaricious and the prodigals who could turn around, so uh, one against the other, uh, how can this be, uh, how can this be possible? Uh, uh, what is, why are we so attached to, to the things of the world? And then Dante goes on explaining uh, on uh, Canto 7 lines 80 and following, uh, he will say, uh, he ordained for he, meaning God, ordained for worldly splendors a general minister and guide who should in due time change vain wealth from race to race and from one to another blood beyond the prevention of human wits so that one race rules and another languishes according to a sentence. Uh, she foresees, judges, and maintains a kingdom as the other heavenly powers do theirs. Her changes have no respite. Necessity makes her swift, so fast men come to take their turn, etc. Uh, this is he who is so reviled, meaning fortune, by the very man that should give her praise, laying on her wrongful blame and ill repute. But she's blessed and does not hear it. Happy with the other primal creatures, she turns her sphere and rejoices in her bliss. It's fortune at the wheel. But it's a figuration that in many ways it needs some, uh, some explaining. How can Dante believe in goddess Fortuna. How can he go on talking about this pagan deity, which is a Roman deity, Lady Luck? Um, how is he doing this? How can that, do you see how, how he, he lives in a world of uh, providentiality, where there is an, well, uh, and he does say that fortune is uh, an intelligence of God. That is to say, not the, though she's blindfolded, there is also a kind of, uh, um, there are some criteria there is an intelligence, there is a will, and a meditation behind it. What it means is that uh, what is up will inevitably turn down to uh, go down. This is it's an endless rotation of fortune. In a certain way, when you are down, uh, you only, the only, it's, it's the he best time to be at because you only have to, you can only go up. We are always, though, on this precariously poised on this, uh, on the curve. Uh, we are never quite uh, stable in our own achievements. How can Dante relate this uh, fortune, idea of fortune to the providential scheme uh, that he, he, uh, he that regulates and shapes his own uh, vision? And what I would have to tell you is that the, uh, the two things. The first thing is that, as you see, Canto Seven begins with an allusion to the great war in uh, heaven. The angels, the primal struggle, that, that disrupted the order of the cosmos. In other words, fortune is for him the divinity that rules over the world, the sublunary world of generation and corruption. That is to say, she is a minister within the, the, the world of the fall, first thing. Uh, so there's still a fallen world and that's our perception of all the changes that take place. And the other thing is that Dante is intimating that the only way to conquer fortune is to really give up. Uh, it's this kind of mystical idea, uh, mystical in the sense of spiritual idea, give up the attachment to the things of this world. So let's stop here uh, with, uh, with uh, br the briefest summary of Canto 7. Let me see if there are questions about some of the uh, weighty issues that I raised in Canto 5 and 6. And there is much more that we can say, but let me see if uh, you want to ask questions and maybe I can clarify things that were left in uh, the background. Please. Um, in Canto 5, you mentioned the Francescan power. What is the significance that Francesca is doing all the talking? What is, uh, the question is a very good question. What is the significance that Francesca is doing all the talking and, uh, and not Paolo, I guess? Uh, I take the, the, the significance is that this is, uh, to me, is that this is uh, a Canto uh, where Dante understands some of the elements that he had put forth in the Vita Nuova. You remember where we discussed the Vita Nuova? And there I indicated that the great poem, Women Who Have Intellect of Love, were the 
um, he discovers that they are the interlocutors uh, about love. Uh, not only are the interlocutors about love, they're also those, they're the privileged interlocutors because they know how to combine, because they understand the necessary interdependence of intellect and love. They are not two separate entities. They are not two separate uh, aspects. And therefore, uh, now he has Francesca as a woman who can become indeed his own uh, interlocutor. That's one aspect. The other one is that medieval romances had made this extraordinary discovery, and I think it's the most revolutionary change that has taken place in the, in the consciousness of, uh, in, the, in the imagination of the, in the Western world uh, in modern times. That is to say, before it became a sociological issue, before it becomes uh, a philosophical problem, the dignity and worth of the woman was already retrieved and vindicated by romances. It's there that the woman becomes either the figure in charge or the partner or friend of, uh, of the man. Does that answer your question? By the way, the answer was yes. <laughs> that could not be picked up by the, the video. Uh, other questions? Well, okay, thank you. We'll see you next time with... Uh, Canto 9, 10, and 11, I guess.